Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Uh, everybody on the internet, welcome to church on the internet. You guys up in the loft, hey, welcome. Could everybody please rise to your feet wherever you're at? Uh, we're going to worship our Lord because our God is great uh, and he's so worthy of our praise, amen. Just such an awesome, awesome God we worship.
lifted me up from the ground Love is the power where my freedom song is found There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no
It's your presence that changes us, that transforms us. So we welcome you. We thank you. And God, I thank you for every person standing here today. I thank you for their lives. I thank you for their hearts. God, you, you know them inside and out. And you know what they're struggling with today. You know what they're dealing with. So Father, I pray that you would minister to, to each person, that you would speak the words to them this morning that they need to hear. You speak to their hearts. And God, I'm going to ask this Father's Day that you as a Heavenly Father would give everyone a big hug. God, we love you. And it's our desire to follow you, to become more and more like you. And we just trust you. I pray that you would be our teacher today as we open up your word and begin to look at it. I pray that you would speak through me. And that we might become doers of what we hear and not just hearers only. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Before you do, why don't you turn to someone next to you and tell them what your favorite vegetable is, and then sit down. Well, good morning, third service. How's everybody doing? Good morning, live streamers. Everybody wave to the live streamers, wherever they're at. It's great to have you. Um, if you are new here this morning, a visitor, it's great to have you. Welcome to the Whitestone family. I encourage you to grab a little gift bag on your way out. We're going to be exiting through those doors. Just grab one. If we run out, there'll be more next week. But welcome. It's great to have you guys here today. All right, a couple quick announcements before we get into the sermon. I want to remind you, I know with this whole virus thing, we've been doing things a little bit differently, and one of the things that we're going to be doing differently is communion. Uh, we are going to be doing that on the 29th of June, and that will be on a Monday night. Uh, rather than during the church service, we're going to live stream it out. And uh, so I encourage you guys to get your juice ready, get your bread ready. And then at 8 p.m. on Monday night, we're going to all celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And so be prepared for that. That's uh, not this Monday, but the following. Also, uh, just to let you know, we're going to be starting up another women's Bible study. We're going to be going through uh, 1 Peter. That's starting July 1st, going through to the end of August. And those, uh, the ladies will be meeting on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. in the adult classroom downstairs on the first floor. Uh, so if you want to sign up for that, uh, just go to the website, uh, mywhitestone.org, and there should be a link for you that. Or you can just look at the bulletin that we've emailed you, and there should be a link to, to sign up for that. All right, uh, tomorrow we've got a uh, new thing starting. Our VBS is going to be starting uh, for all the kids, and I'm going to welcome up our VBS director. Where is she? Let's put our hands together for Jamie Meissner. And Jamie dresses like this every day of the week, so it's nothing really new here. But uh... I'm super excited. Our VBS starts tomorrow. It's for ages 3 through going into 6th grade. Um, we are live streaming every day this week, Monday through Friday. You'll be able to find that on whitestone.live. If you cannot watch it at 10 a.m., you will be able to access it on BoxCast and YouTube later on in the day, just like you would access one of our services that you watch. 
We do have a, if you have not pre-registered, we do have a few more bags left. You can see me at the info desk af after the service. But the great thing about it being virtual is that you can still watch it whether you have a bag or not. It really doesn't matter. So feel free to invite your friends, family, people that aren't local to, to join us for our VBS where we're going to learn how Jesus' power pulls us through. Thank you, Jamie. Awesome. <laughs> All right, fathers, I want to be talking to you right now at this moment. Father's Day is a day that we set apart uh, from all the other days of the year to just honor you, to thank God for you, to show our gratitude to you for just uh, being the fathers that you are. And so at this moment, I'm just going to just uh, speak a blessing over you, and I want you to just let the words soak in. Now, I know all of us fathers are in different points of being fathers. Some of us have kids are already grown. Some of us are just starting the process, and then there's everything in between. So whatever uh, uh, one of my comments actually stick, I want you just to let it soak in and let it minister to you this morning. But first of all, fathers, may God strengthen you, because as a father in the years ahead, you are going to face many long nights, many early mornings, and many exhausting days. So be prepared for that. May God give you strength to do that. And fathers, may God grant you wisdom to navigate dirty diapers, um, potty training, tying shoes, teaching how to tie shoes, curfews, homework, driving lessons, and eventually entering adulthood. May God give you the needed wisdom for that because trust me, you're going to need it. And fathers, may your heart be filled with love as you feel the little arms of your children being wrapped around you. Soak those moments up. Treasure them. And fathers, may you know that the years spent giving bedtime stories, picking up spaghetti from the kitchen floor, and cleaning up wet beds in the middle of the night, remember that those years are spent serving Jesus himself. Remember that, fathers. And fathers, may God empower you to talk about the awkward subjects with your younger children, and may he empower you to have the difficult conversations with your teenagers. You need to have those conversations, and you're the one to do that job. Fathers, may you know the riches of making family memories, whether it be going up north, going to the lake, or just gathering around the dinner table, or just snuggling on the couch at a family movie night. Make those memories. Fathers, may you know the affection of your heavenly Father as he watches you father your own little ones. He loves watching you, and he wants to join you in it. Let him. Fathers, may your sons and daughters never doubt how strong your love is for them. In fact, maybe you need to remind them today. They can never hear it enough. Fathers, may you in turn also hear 10,000 I love you's from your children. And when you hear those, just feel it. Let it sink into your bones. Fathers, may your home be filled with laughter, dance parties, heart-to-heart -heart talks, Healthy dose of family competition as you play Pictionary or whatever you do you play. Fathers, may the Holy Spirit counsel you and comfort you as you counsel and comfort your children. Fathers, may you know the satisfaction of seeing your children grow up and follow Jesus and seek Him on their own. Fathers, may your children know your kindness and your goodness and your generosity even though they might not understand its entirety right now until they're older. And fathers, may you understand that even though your children may be older, they will never stop needing you. So may you represent well the role of fatherhood to your children right up to your dying day. And fathers, today on Father's Day, I know that you want to enjoy the love being poured out on you from your children, but remember this, as wonder, wonderful as the love of your children may be, may you always know the deep love that your Heavenly Father has for you. And as His child, He notices you. He knows your heart. He hears your prayers. He treasures you. And He loves you with a love that is beyond measure. And so today, fathers, I want you to bask in your Heavenly Father's love because it can change your life. Fathers, if I could get you to stand where you are, I want to pray for you. And if you're in live stream, wherever you're at, stand up where you are, fathers. 
And if there's anyone close to these fathers who are standing, I want you just to reach out and place your hand on them. And I want you to join with me in prayer as I pray for these fathers. God, I want to thank you for the men who are standing in front of me today. God, you know every detail about them. You knit them together in their mother's womb and you know their very lives. And God, I pray that you might pour out your grace on these men and equip them to become the best fathers that they could ever be, no matter what their age. May you give them the the grace to be able to grow closer and closer to you, Jesus, and to live out your character. God, for the remainder of their lives, may you give them the ability to serve this role to its fullest capacity and to represent you, God, our Heavenly Father. And may they do it well. God, bless these men. May they experience you today in in a very powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give a round of applause to our fathers. And after the service, fathers, on your way out, grab a Snickers bar. It's for you. Kind of upped our game a little bit this year. Is that a jerky? <clears throat> well, guys, we're going to be wrapping up the series today. What was initially intended to be an only three-week service, our series uh, ended up being a six-week series, which is good. I'm glad we did that because uh, I think we talked about some very important things that we needed to talk about in this whole Get in the Game series. And, and I hope you've been putting these, these things into practice. I, I truly do. The whole need to get rid of fear. The, the need to get back to the fundamentals of the Christian life, the need to put in the practice the words of Jesus, the need uh, to endure, the need uh, to, to trust the Lord, all those things, those are super important things. And I'll tell you, if you need to review, if you need to revisit these topics, I encourage you, go to the website, listen to the sermons again, put these things into practice, because I'll tell you guys, if we just hear them and forget them and ignore them, there's no point. We need to live these things out. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, for this last week, what I thought we should end with is the idea of working alongside of God in what He's doing. And and the reason I want to address this is because so many people have approached me over these last few months and asked me what I think is happening to this world. I mean, this world has gone crazy. What's going on? And so many of these people are fearful of how it's going to affect this nation, of of how it's going to affect the church across the world, or how it's going to affect their very own individual lives. And and I get it. I mean, the year 2020 has most certainly hit us with about as much as you can imagine, and and it doesn't seem like it's going to let up anytime soon. We started off this year knowing that it was going to be election year, and we all know what election year is is like. It's rough. It's rough. It gets rowdy. I mean, people are ready to, to, you know, get their guns and have ready. They have all their signs ready to put in their yard to support their guy. And they're on Facebook ready to post and to rip on each other, and they're ready for this year. And so we started out this year talking about unity because we thought that the division we were going to face was just going to be the election year. Little did we know. And then this crazy COVID-19 hit us out of nowhere. And let me tell you, if you thought the election year was divisive, this, this virus has con- caused so much division, it's crazy. Within any group that you know, there's division, there's differences of opinion. And of course, we get on our Facebook and we post our opinions, we post our agendas, we post, you know, what we think are viewpoints of stuff, and, 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 you know, we just, we rip on the people we don't agree with, and that's how it goes. Not only that, I mean, let's just set the division aside, this virus has really changed how we do life, hasn't it? It's really messed with things. Like you go to the grocery store now, it's weird. Like you go into an aisle, and if you see two people in the aisle, you're like, maybe I should go to another aisle. (laughs) Because if you go down the aisle, you know, they kind of look at you, and you have to kind of like get good by them because you don't want to invade their space. It's weird. It's different. Not only that, man, here at church we're doing things different. I mean, never in my entire life did I ever think that we would be putting limitations on the amount of people that we allow into this building to attend church service. (laughs) Never did I think that. Churches just don't do that. We want as many people as can come to worship the Lord, to to learn about Him together. The more, the better. And yet we've been finding ourselves saying, okay, a certain amount of people in this room, a certain amount of people in that room, a certain amount of people in the loft. It's changed how we do things. And then if the virus wasn't enough... We, we then had this, the horrific thing that happened with George Floyd, an evil act against a man created in God's image. 
which then sparked a huge outcry across our nation and even the world. And suddenly all of our cities were being filled with protests and riots. And of course the looting and the vandalism. But once again, division happening all around us. So much division. Everybody has their opinion. You know, their viewpoint on something. Which in our world today, what do we do with our opinion? We like to post it on Facebook. We like to post it on social media. And as you all know, that's super effective at bringing peace. It's just the opposite, isn't it? And I want to say this again. I know you guys are sick and tired of me ripping on Facebook. I get it, the old Unity series I was. But I just want to say this again. Guys, please, please stop using Facebook to promote your agenda or your opinion or your viewpoint. First of all, it does not work. Nobody looks at your post and go, wow, I think I'm going to change my mind. Nobody does that. In fact, all they're going to do is they're going to rip you to pieces because of your viewpoint. So don't do it. Secondly, it just allows the enemy to stir up more dissension. And so guys, let's stop giving the enemy more fuel for his fire. I mean, listen, if you're going to use Facebook, if you have to use Facebook, and I think we can get along without it, but if you're going to have to use Facebook, go back to posting pictures about your supper. Okay? <laughs> about your garden or whatever, about your kids playing sports. Post those pictures. That's fine. We want to see that stuff. Don't promote your opinion. But yeah, this world around us is a mess. It's raging with hurt. It's raging with anger and confusion and fear and intense division. And it's easy to let yourself get worked up about it. It's easy to start thinking, you know, maybe we should buy a bunch of guns Pack up and move to the Rocky Mountains, way out in the wilderness, and just live off the land. Get out of Dodge. Seriously, I know people who have thought like that. They've actually started making steps to do that. They fear what the world is coming to, and I get it. Humanly looking at what's going on around us can cause a lot of fear and a lot of worry. I get it. But listen to me. In third service, I need you to hear me on this. Listen, our God, the one that we worship, the one that we follow, the one that we believe in, our God is not surprised by anything that has happened in 2020. None of what has happened so far in our country or the world in 2020 has caught God by surprise. It's not like God is sitting there and going, oh, wow, this virus came out of nowhere. What am I going to do about that? No. No. He's not surprised. Now, third service, that should bring us great comfort. That should give us great comfort, a level of peace, knowing that our God is not surprised by this. You know, I, I first got married, I lived in Arizona, next, close to my parents. And for those of you who don't know, my, my, parent, my dad is a pilot. He was a bush pilot, missionary pilot grew up in South America. And when I got married, my dad says, hey, Luke, you know, you... A lot of people would die to get a private pilot's license. Would you want to? Would you want to get your license and be able to solo a plane, have your own license for an airplane? And you have a free instructor. I'm your dad. I'll be glad to do it for free for you. You know, would you want that? And I'm like, eh, Dad. You know, I've never really been that hipped up on flying. I, first of all, I get kind of sick when I'm flying, but I'm just like, Dad, I don't know. And he's like, Luke, seriously. I mean, you should at least try it. So I'm like, okay, you know, sure, let's just try it. So I decided to, you know, give it a shot. And so Dad says, all right, well, let's start out in a Super Cub. And if you don't know what a Super Cub, this is a picture of the Super Cub here. And it's made of tubular aluminum structure. And wrapped around that tubular structure is not metal. It's some sort of fabric, some sort of cloth-like thing. So basically, you're flying a dishcloth up, <laughs> up in the air. It's, it's really what it is. I mean, a simple little bird scratching a claw down, it would rip it. I mean, it's just, it's crazy stuff. But anyways, we go up into the Super Cub, and we're doing, you know, figure eights, and we're flying. He's letting me get a feel of it. And he goes, all right, look, I want you to do a stall. Now, the word stall and airplanes really shouldn't be together, but he's just saying, I want you to practice a stall. And so what you get with a stall is you, you bring the airplane up like that until there's no more air, air flow going over the wings, and it just starts to fall out of the sky, Okay. And so we're going up there, and the, the Super Cub has like a stick or a yoke that you, you kind of fly it around like this. And I'm pulling it back, and I'm getting up and going up, going up, going up into this stall. And eventually, now, when you're watching a stall from the ground, it's not all that impressive. The plane just goes like this, and then, you know, eventually goes down. 
But when you're in the airplane, it's terrifying if you don't know what you're doing. So I'm pulling back, we're going up, and all of a sudden, this plane, this cloth plane starts shaking like this and shuddering, and, and there's, this, there's this buzzer warning, this stall warning is going, yeah, like that, and you're shaking like this. It starts to scare me, but instantly Dad get a, gets on the radio. We have radio. He's like, Luke, relax. It's okay. This is normal. Just as you know, and he talks me through it. Now, the minute Dad said, everything's okay, this is completely nor- normal, knowing that Dad was not surprised by what was going on, put me at peace. I was like, oh, okay, cool. The Dad, Dad's the one who knows his stuff. Then I'm okay about it, and we could go through the stall. And you know what, guys? When it comes to our life, the same th- should be true about God. God is not surprised by this stuff. He knows the end from the beginning. He isn't surprised by anything. And so nothing, you know, catches our God by surprise. And that should comfort us, deeply comfort us. Now let me go a step further in this. Not only is God not surprised in all this, but guess what? Our God is working. He's working in the midst of all this turmoil in 2020. In third service... This should make us excited. Our God is at work. Amen? God has not packed up and moved to the Rocky Mountains. Okay? No, he's working. He's working in this world. He's working in this nation. He's working in the lives of individuals. Our God is at work. And I know it's easy to look at this world around us and start to think that he isn't, but he is. I know it's easy to say, Luke, but this world is so evil. How could God be working? Guys, let me just tell you something. This world has always been evil. This world has always been facing division. It's always been in chaos and ruin. This world has always been facing evil of many kinds. And through it all, God has never abandoned us, and he's never stopped working. And that should bring us great peace. Just knowing that should greatly comfort us. Like just knowing that my dad was in the back seat of the Super Cub. His hand was on the yoke. He was working behind the scenes. He didn't abandon me. He didn't leave me. He was working. Now, I know that in this world, God can do and he will do whatever he wants to do and work however he wants to do it. But primarily, the way that God wants to work through this world is through his body, the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. Guess who that's talking about? You. You are the body of Christ. Yes, in Ephesians it says that Jesus is the head of that body, but we are the body of Christ. We, in other words, we are his hands and feet. We are his eyes and ears. We are his legs and arms. We are his, his mouthpiece. In other words, we are to be a major conduit by which God is working in this evil world. God is working, and he wants to use us to accomplish what he's wanting to do. Does that make sense? Can I get a big amen for that? Okay, good. So if that's true, and we all agree with that, then there's a serious question we need to ask ourselves. Where is God working, and how do I join him in it? Listen, if we want to get in the game and we want to have impact in the game for for our Lord, then we need to know where he's working and how do we join him in that work. It's really that simple. So how do we do that practically? How do we put that into practical terms? Well, guys, the first thing that we need to do, and I know this seems obvious, but it's, it's profoundly true. The first thing we need to do is to make ourselves available for him to be able to use us. If we want to be used by God, we got to make ourselves available to him to be able to use us. You know, back to the story of coaching football, it was my job to send the players in, you know, to their positions and whatnot. So, you know, it came time for us to be on defense, so I'm like, blue defense, get out there, blue defense, get out there. So they, all the kids run out there and whatever, and then all, suddenly I noticed my middle linebacker was missing. So I'm like, hey, who's the middle linebacker? Who's, who's on the blue defense? And I'm like, Jenkins? Where's Jenkins? Jenkins is over there by the water bottles. He's squirting and playing a water fight with some other guy. And I'm like, God, Jenkins, you're supposed to be out there. Well, there'd be another kid that's standing there and say, I'll go in there, coach. So I'm like, go in there, buddy. You're in there. You're the middle linebacker. And so that's how it worked. You know, there's a story in Isaiah where it says to Isaiah, he 
he sees this vision of the Lord. And it's this beautiful story. He says, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and the train of his glory filled the temple. And you know, Isaiah, when he saw this, he, he said he was undone. He realized that he was a sinful man in the presence of Almighty God. And he realized, oh my word, I'm going to perish. And it's a just really cool story I encourage you to read. But after all that, God speaks to Isaiah, and he asks him a question. He says, he goes, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? God was wanting to know who would be willing to, to go and proclaim this message to his people. He was looking for someone to be able to do that. And guess how Isaiah replies. This is how he replies. He goes, here am I. Send me. Now, that answer is absolutely incredible because we don't do that, do we? When God says, who is going to do this for me? Who is going to accomplish this work for me? What we will do is like, well, why don't you take Tom? He's retired. He's got the time. We offer somebody else up. But not Isaiah. It's like he raised his hand. He says, hey, hey God, I don't know if you see me. I, I'm willing to do it. Send me. And that attitude is the attitude that you and I need to have. We have to, have to make ourselves available to God to be used by Him however He sees fit. Now, not only do we make ourselves available to God, we need to be about the work that He is doing. Not just the work that we want to be doing. And guys, I know this seems super obvious, but we miss it all the time. There's a verse that says this, just the very beginning part of the verse, it says this, for we are God's fellow workers. For we are God's fellow workers. What is a fellow worker? Well, a fellow worker is someone who is working with God on what God is doing. We might use in the, you know, our everyday vernacular now, we might say a co-worker. And that's pretty close to saying that we're co-workers with God. We're fellow workers with God, and that's what it should be. Working together with Him on what he is doing. Now notice I said what he is doing. So often we pour our energies on things that have nothing to do with what God is doing. We're told to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And yet what we're doing is we're seeking first our kingdom. Our activity is what's important. About 10 or 12 years ago, I decided to side my house. I bought a house that was in, made in 1904. And it had cedar siding, and over top of that cedar siding was this asbestos kind of slate siding. And to be able to have somebody do it was an astronomical price, and so I decided to do it myself. And so I put my boys to work. And they were like 8 or 10 years old. I put them to work, and there's it. Some people might say this is child abuse and forced child labor. I grew up in South America. This is common practice, okay? <laughs> So anyways, I put them to work. But the crazy thing is, is the minute I would turn around, by the way, they're wearing tool boots to look good there. I don't think they used them much. Every time I would turn, them, turn around, they would disappear. And I'd be like, Caleb, Max, where are you guys? Come around the corner, and they're whipping things at each other, and you know, fighting, whatever. And I'm like, get back to work. Come on, we've got to keep working here. And then I'd turn around again. They'd be gone like, Caleb, Max, walk around the house, nowhere. So I'd go inside. They'd be playing video games. They're like, guys, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, we thought you were done. I'm like, done? We're not done. One time I came around the corner, and Max was taking a selfie with his dog. This is the picture of it here. <laughs> Trying to be working, he, that's what he's doing. It seemed like every time I turned around, they were off doing something else. And you know what the funny thing is, is that when we talk about it now, the boys will say, Hey, Dad, remember when we sighted the house? when we sighted the house. And I'm like, well, I'm not sure there was a whole lot of we going on there, but yeah, I remember. And you know, I think that's how it is with God and us so often. We like to call ourselves fellow workers of God, but we aren't often working with Him. We're off doing our own thing. Guys, we have to learn to actually join Him in what He's doing and work with Him. Now what that means is that we're going to have to train our minds to always be listening and asking what God wants us to do so that we can join Him in it. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes what God wants us to be doing isn't what we think we should be doing. Sometimes what God wants us to be doing isn't what we want to be doing. 
But trust me, if God is telling us to join him in what he's doing, it's the absolute best thing that we could do. We need to obey him in it. You know, back to that super cub in that stall. You know, dad is on the radio with me, and you're, we're pulling back, and this plane's all, and the, the, the thing's like, like that. The, the tendency, what you'll do, is because when the plane starts to drop, what you do is you, you find yourself, what seems intuitive, is you want to pull back even more because you want to pull up out of that. And that's the opposite thing you do. And so dad's on the radio, he says, all right, Luke, push that yoke forward, push it forward, lean it forward. And so the minute I do that, the plane suddenly dips, and next thing you know, we're plumbing, plummeting to the earth in a fabric airplane towards the ground. But that creates airspeed, and boom, suddenly we could pull out, and that's how we get out of a stall. And I'm listening to my dad talk me through it as we're doing this. But guys, what would happen if I ignored dad? What if I'm like, oh, dad, yep, 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 I turn you off. <laughs> the results would be devastating. I had to keep listening to dad to do what he said. Now, for us to do that in our life with God, let me tell you, it doesn't come natural. What does come natural is that we just do our thing, which, as you know, has dire consequences. Look at your own life. Think of the things that you've just done on your own, done it without God. See how well it's turned out? For us to do this, guys, it's going to take training. It's going to take effort on our part. Because like I said, our minds are usually only thinking about what we want to do. And we're so used to focusing on the physical, seeing world and living by only what we see. And if we live focusing only on, what the, see, only on the seen world, guys, guess what? We're not going to be living out lives of faith. And in Hebrews it says, it's impossible to please God without faith. Colossians 3.2 says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Paul is saying, listen, stop focusing on earthly things. What are earthly things? They're the things that we see, what's going on around our world. He says, no, set your mind on things above. What are things above? It's God's unseen activity and his kingdom at work. He goes on to say, for you have died with Christ and you are, you know, seated with him in the heavenlies. You're hidden with him. We need to train our minds to focus on the unseen reality of God and his kingdom and his activity. That's where our actions need to emanate from. Remember, guys, he's the one who knows what to do and how to do it. So we need to keep our eyes on him and listen to him so that we can join him in it. Now, for those of you who took phase one discipleship, you've seen this before. And I think I did it once in a sermon. But in discipleship, we talk about how we all have a kingdom. We all have circles of influence. Okay? It's, it's places over which we have say. Okay? And the center of our kingdom starts with where? Who? Jeff. Just me. It starts with me, us. Okay? So it's, it's all about me. Now, the second circle of our kingdom would be our family. And that would include, you know, our wife and kids. The third one is our money and possessions. Fourth one would be our work. And the fifth one is basically our community, okay? Just our friends, strangers that we encounter, basically everything in our community. Okay, so that's our circles of influence. Now, our goal is to align our kingdom under the kingdom of God, to align our activity under the activity of God. That's what, our, that's what we should be doing. That's what we should be focusing on. We should be bringing it so that we can do things in his name, join him in that work, okay? So basically what we should be doing is we should be looking, okay, God, where are you working in me? What are you doing in my life? What, what area of character are you, you focusing on? Because I want to join you, God, in that. I don't want to resist you. I want to join with you in how you're working with me. God, how, how are you working in my wife's life? Because I want to join you in that. How are you working in my daughter's life? How are you working in my son's life? Because I want to join you, God, in how you're working in their life. I want, to be, I want to be a co-worker with you. God, how are you working with my money and possessions? What do you want to do with that? Because I don't want to resist you in that. I want to join with you. God, what are you doing at my work? 
What are you doing in my co-worker's you know, job, the guy that works in the cubicle next to me? What are you doing in his life? What are you doing in my company? Because God, I want to be your fellow worker. I want to work with you in that. And God, what are you doing with my friends? What are you doing in that stranger's life there? Because I want to join with you. I want to be a fellow worker with you in that. That's what we should be doing. Now, guys, here's the crazy part. In every one of these circles, guess how many things we should be doing with Jesus? All of them. Everything. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed. Now, let me ask you, third service, how much does that leave out? Nothing. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do you see that? Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, doesn't leave much out. And what are we to do it? We're to do it in the name of Jesus. Now, what does that even mean? It means that we're to be doing everything for Jesus, on behalf of Jesus, using the resources of Jesus. To use a crude metaphor, it's a little bit like a power of attorney. That's what a power of attorney does. He does something for someone else, on behalf of someone else, using that someone else's resources. Well, that's how we're to be doing everything in our life. In the name of Jesus in every one of those circles of our kingdom. And you know what, guys, where I think so many of us make our mistake is that we think, listen, if I can't make some big change, then what's the point? There's no point in doing anything. And guys, let me just say something. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because anything done with Christ can have eternal ripple effects. Now notice, what's the key word in that phrase? With Christ. With. Anything done with Christ. Now if we try to do it by ourselves, it's not going to have eternal ripple effects. But anything done with Christ will have eternal ripple effects. I don't care how big or small. Like I always think of the story of David. David and Goliath, we all love that story. It's an amazing story of how a little boy slayed a big giant. But you know, verses before that, how the story starts off, he's taking care of his sheep. And his dad comes to David and says, Hey, David, I want you to take some cheese to your brother, your brothers. I want you to go on a cheese run. And imagine if David goes, Dad, I don't want to hike all the way there and bring cheese. They don't need cheese. They're men, okay? They can live without cheese for a while. I don't feel like going. I don't want to do it. What if David had simply just not obeyed his father? We wouldn't have the story in Scripture that we have today. But David did a simple thing. He obeyed his father, and he went, and God used him to slay a giant. And there's still ripple effects happening because of that. Apostle Paul, he gets chained up in a prison. And of obedience to God, he's taking care of these churches by writing them letters, encouraging them, building them up. Now guess what? Those letters are a huge part of what the New Testament is. We still use them today. The ripple effects of that go on and on and on. When we're obedient to Jesus, we join with him in what he is doing. And he could take something little, tiny, little something that we have done and do something great with it. And and as I said, it will have eternal ripple effects. You know what eternal means? It means that it will go on and on for the rest of eternity. Now, we may never see these ripple effects this side of heaven, but that doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is we obey Jesus. And we join with him in what he's doing. Here's a really small example. When this virus came and we had to close our building doors, I got to be honest with you, that kind of rattled me. Uh, I I didn't know what to do. I was kind of like, man, how can I be a pastor if I can't be allowed to be with, you know, my people? I mean, people are my business. I'm a people person. I love people. And suddenly we're being told that we can't come to church anymore. You know, it just didn't seem right. And I honestly didn't know what to do. And I mean, yeah, I know I, I knew I need to keep preaching, but even that was weird because I'm staring at this camera, you know, preaching a sermon. I don't know, you know, if it, it's connecting with anybody. I don't even know if you're listening. I know how you guys are. You know, honey, I'm going to go to the fridge, you know, while it's going on. And <laughs> you come back, you miss everything. I don't know. what. So that was weird to me. So one day I was praying. I was like, you know, God, what do I do? I, I, don't, I don't understand this. How do I join you in what you're doing? And I felt like the Lord says, Luke, I want you to call everyone in the directory. I was like, okay, big deal. Call through the directory. But I'm like, okay, God, you said to do it. I'm going to do it. And so I literally started with the letter A. 
And I started calling people through the directory. Now, you know what? Guess what? I'm not done yet. It has been the most delightful experience ever. I have been calling people, and some of the conversations have lasted over an hour. There was one woman who's been cooped up in her house for over two months, and, and she hasn't been hugged by anyone, not even her children. And after the phone call, you know, as we were hanging up, she was crying. She's like, Luke, thank you so much. Got to call one woman on her birthday, and we celebrated her birthday over the phone. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. I have thoroughly enjoyed doing this. And, you know, every time for the phone call, I'm like, all right, Jesus, let's talk to this person together. And it's been awesome. In fact, it's to the point where I'm like, you know, I don't need a quarantine to be able to have an excuse to call people. I'm just going to call my church family. I love it. It's awesome. Now, I don't know the ripple effects of those phone conversations, but I don't need to know them. All I need to do is what God tells me to do and join with them. Another example, just a couple weeks ago, I've been trying to acknowledge God in the things that I'm doing. I'm trying to invite him, say, all right, God, you know, I'm just not going to just do what I want to do. I want to acknowledge you so that you can direct my paths. And several weeks ago when this George Floyd was killed by the policeman and we suddenly had this whole racial tension surfacing in all of our cities. Once again, I did not know what to do. Uh, now, let me explain myself, and I'm just being completely vulnerable and honest here. You know, I grew up in South America, and so the Latin culture, I, I know the Latin culture. I love the Latin culture. I'm completely at home with the Latin culture. When I'm around someone who's Latin American, I love it. I just, I'm, I'm at home. But I never grew up around the African American, you know, communities. I, I don't know what that culture, I don't know anything about that culture, hardly at all. Now, not because I don't want to, it's just I didn't have the opportunity to. And in general, but especially when these things happen in our nation, but in general, as a white person, I'm often at, at a real loss as to how to act or what to say around an African American. Where I'm just like, you know, I, I, I get all nervous. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to say something that's going to offend him. I don't want to do something. So a lot, a lot of times I just don't say anything. And, and when these situations happen in our nation, I want so bad to help the situation, but I'm at a loss as to how. And often I think, man, this problem is so big. It's so systemic. It's so huge. What is little tiny Luke Dye going to do about it? And so often I do nothing. Well, the other day I was walking in the parking lot from my truck in this building, and I was making several trips back and forth, and I, I walked by this car. There was an African-American couple working on the car, and somebody was helping them. The hood was up. And when I walked by this couple, I instantly felt in my spirit. I felt like the Lord said, Luke, I want you to talk to this couple. And I'm like, ooh, I don't know what to say. I guess I'm getting all nervous. I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I, this is, freaks me out. And so you know how it is when we kind of set parameters for God, and I'm like, God, listen. If you orchestrate that we meet perfectly on the parking lot, then I'll talk to this person. But if that doesn't happen, then obviously you're not wanting me to talk to them. So I'm walking back and forth between my truck and my building, and about the seventh trip, you know, I'm turning around, and there I'm coming like, well, God, apparently you don't want me to talk to these guys. And I made sure I turned around, and there they were, and we were walking. And then we just perfectly met. So I'm like... All right, Jesus, let's do this together. And so I said, hey, guys, do you mind if I ask you a few questions? And they said, sure. And I said, how, how are you guys holding up in all this? And you could see the body language. They were just like, they were so sad. And they're like, oh, it's, it's hard. It's heartbreaking. And they says, you know, we don't agree with the rioting and the looting and vandalism stuff, but it still hurts. All this stuff hurts. And I said, can I ask you a question? Have you ever experienced racism? And they says, oh, yeah, all the time. And the guy says, you know, I grew up in, in Chicago. It wasn't that bad. But when I moved to Wisconsin, I get it all the time. People call me the N-word all the time. And they just treat me poor at my job. The woman, she was biracial. She had a white mother and a black father. And when she was a kid in school, she was over and over told by her friends that your mother was in sin for having married a black person. So you're a result of sin. And that's what she grew up with. So here's this couple where you can see they're wearing the weight of this world. They're wearing generations of having their ancestors being treated like property where they were forced into slavery. I can see it on these people's faces. And I said, guys, I want to say something to you. And I don't know if it will mean anything, but I just want to say it to you. Um, 
What happened to your people years ago where you were forced into slavery, where you were treated like property, was wrong. It's evil, and God hated it. And I am so sorry that that happened to your ancestors. And I says, and on behalf of the white people, which it was my ancestors who did it, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. You know, that couple almost started crying. And the guy goes, sir, I am so glad you said that. Thank you for saying that. It means the world to us that a white man would say that. And then we parted ways. Now, I don't know the ripple effects of that conversation, but that doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is I just wanted to join Jesus in doing something that he was doing. Now, did I fix the racial problem? Not even close. But in my little circle of influence, I just joined Jesus and what he was doing. And God can take something small and bring ripple effects for the rest of eternity. Amen? Amen. And that's what we want to be doing. Now, guys, those are just two minor examples of how when we ask God where we can join him in doing what he's doing, he'll show us and he'll use us. You know what hit me that day as I was driving away from that encounter? It hit me that I should be doing this all day, every day, in all the circles of my influence. And, and it made me realize how little I do. Because as I'm just doing my thing, I'm not seeking first his kingdom, I'm seeking mine. But I could make a 180 on that and I could say, you know what? No, I'm going to seek his kingdom. So Whitestone, let's do this. Let's learn to join God in what he's doing. Let's seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, the right way to do things, and stop doing things the way that we want to do them. Amen? Because in doing so, guys, we're going to be fellow workers with God. Guys, uh, listen to me. The world desperately needs fellow workers with God to step up and start working where God wants us to be working, doing what he wants us to be doing. Guys, we need to get in the game. Let's get rid of fear. Let's get rid of it. There's no need for it. It just paralyzes us. Let's get back to the fundamentals of the Christian life. Let's engage in the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. Let's do the things that feed our spirit, knowing that His grace is going to be working with us. We have to put effort into the Christian life. Remember, guys, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Let's take the words of Jesus and let's put them into practice. Not just learn about them. No, put them into practice. Practice, practice, practice. So that when the storms of life come and the wind and the waves and the, the, the storm crashes against our house, our house will stand strong. Why? Because we built on the rock. Let's learn to endure. Because endurance is what's going to take us from the point of suffering. And trust me, we're going to suffer. But endurance, as we endure, it will lead us to a life of character and a life of hope. But we need to learn how to endure. And let's trust Let's trust our coach. Let's not lean on our own understanding. Let's trust him with all of our heart. Remember, he wants all of our life, so let's trust him with all of our heart. Let's not lean on the way we think things should be. Let's lean on him, and he will direct our paths. And lastly, let's, let's join God in what he's doing. Let's become fellow workers of God, making ourselves available to him to use us however he sees fit, to do what he wants us to do however he wants to do it. We are his body, remember that. So let's let the head use his body however he wants to use it. This world needs us to get in the game, so let's get in the game. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. And God, I'm just speaking for myself here. There's so much in this that I'm lacking. As I look at the circles of my kingdom, there's just so many areas where I'm just doing it my way. God, forgive me for that. And I know I'm speaking on every person's behalf this morning. God, I pray that you'd pour out your grace on us in ways that we would start to join you in your work. That we would allow you to change not only us, but every circle. And that the ripple effects may go on for eternity. God, we love you, and we thank you that you do life with us 
that you don't leave us, you don't abandon us, you don't forsake us. And you'll be with us till the end of this age. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, I, I love you so stinking much. I sure just love doing life with you. Have an amazing week. We'll see you next Sunday. And fathers, happy Father's Day to you. Kids, spoil your father today. Do everything for him. Grab your Snickers on the way out, and we'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>